Welcome to the Polgar Chess University. In this lesson, we'll talk about how to find a plan. And as examples, we're using some of Bobby Fischer's games. Let's look at our first example in this lesson. Here we are. This is a game that was played between white Bobby Fischer and black, the German Grandmaster Darga, in 1960. In this position, we're having a complete material balance, however, it is rather obvious that the black king is in a definitely delicate position without normal defense around the king. Well, that's all nice and beautiful, however, the question is how to make progress. What white needs to do is a bit of regrouping. The bishop on a3 may have been doing something important at one point, but it certainly isn't right now, and that bishop could be relocated to a better square. Using your imagination, try to envision that bishop being somewhere else in a better location. What squares would come to mind? Well, certainly e3, f4, or f2, g3, any of those squares would look pretty attractive for the bishop, attacking, pressuring either the b6 pawn or attacking directly black's king. Clearly, e3 or f4 are the squares where the bishop can get easily and quickly, so therefore that should be a plan. In general, when you don't quite sure what to do, it seems that your previous plan came to a dead end, you don't know how to continue, one of the most common and uh, best advices is look around which of your pieces would need improvement. And the one that's uh, usually easiest to improve, usually that's what you go with, although there may be different situations that you may improve a different piece. Like in this case, it's also quite clear that white's queen on b1 is not in an ideal position. Let's say b5 would be a better place for the queen, closer to the enemy king. However, you will have to set the priority straight, which is more urgent and more important. In this case, it is the relocation of the bishop. Why? Because it accomplishes two things all at once. On one hand, that plan will improve the positioning of the bishop, but also at the same time it will open up the A file and therewith also improve the position of the rook that's on A1. So it accomplishes actually improves the positioning of two pieces all at once. Let's see how all of this works out in practice. Fisher played bishop c1. Well, don't get misled by the fact that the bishop moved back to its initial square. This is something very temporary. The bishop is about to reappear on e3 or f4, depending how black continues now. One important thing to notice is, making sure you're aware of it and prepared for it, is that now the black queen is able to come to e1 to check white's king. And we'll look at that in just a moment, as that's exactly what happened in the game. Before we follow up with that, let's just see another option, which could have been, instead of queen e1, playing knight e5, attacking the rook. Well, now the rook wouldn't need to retreat, but the white could follow up with the plan as planned, with bishop f4, pinning the knight. And for example, if rook e8, white would get the queen into the game with queen b5, threatening with rook a7, check, and white's position is awesome. So let's go back to the position after white played bishop c1 and see what happened after the check. Of course, Y doesn't have much of a choice but to block and now the queen captured the pawn. 
Well, true, true, this was a pawn sacrifice. However, this is, of course, a very calculated and hoped-for scenario. The bishop comes to f4 with a check, gaining time, and after king b7, there was only one more move played in the game. Black's position is hopeless. The white queen enters the game and it immediately ends it at the same time. Because the bishop is on f4 right now and it controls the b8 and c7 squares, white now is threatening to checkmate on the very following move with queen a6. Black is in a very sad situation as for example if the knight would move back to b8 white could just capture that knight and then after that black's rook on d7 would find itself in an unprotected position. Moving the knight to b4 even worse because the white queen immediately would capture that same rook or if the black rook would move to a8 white would just trade rooks and then grab the knight and win soon after. A very fine move such as bishop c1 with the idea of regrouping the bishop to a more useful location is a very typical way to improve your position. Let's move on and look at another game that Bobby Fischer played, that one in 1967 against the Soviet Grandmaster Panov. Again we are having material balance and the question is how can white make progress? The challenge seems to be that the white knight on e4 is in a pin. It cannot move to d6 because the queen is on c2 hanging. So what to do? How to make progress? One thing that certainly is good for white that black has already played f6 and having played h6 and f6 both at the same time is rarely a good idea because it weakens key light squares in between those pawns obviously I'm referring to the g6 square. The first thing in such situations to look for is some tactical idea to win material immediately. We already discussed the fork with knight d6 is out of question so is the discovery approach of knight takes pawn on f6 because in addition to the pawn which of course would lose the queen the black queen can also capture back and that would lead to a winning position for black because white would have lost a knight after that. Now the other thing we see in this position is the white rooks kind of being unusually active on the third and fourth rank. Now if those rooks can be effectively used for the attack then it's all great and beautiful. Otherwise they may find themselves misplaced. So let's try to focus on those rooks and see if we can gain time and initiative by attacking black queen. And that's exactly what happened right now White played in the game rook f3. Now black has to be extremely careful where to go. For example, if the black queen right now goes to g6, then already the earlier mentioned discovery will gain power because now after knight f6, even if the queen captures, that queen will be taken by the rook. And of course, if the pawn captures, then the black queen is unprotected on g6. Okay, so this was the simple part. So let's go back to the position after rook f3 and let's examine another move. What happens if the queen goes the other way to e6? Well, now the problem will be exactly what we have discussed earlier, namely the weakness of the g6 square. However, white needs to act very aggressively and quickly. And here the winning combination is, again, knight takes f6 
and then with the idea of getting the queen into the attack with queen g6. It's quite easy to see that doesn't matter which way the king goes, the rook on that file will capture the pawn and lead to an easily won position. And finally, let's see how the game itself continued after rook f3. Black made a very bad looking move and usually ugly looking moves are bad as well. Queen h7, what a place for a queen. White has to strike now while the black pieces are misplaced. And again the sacrifice comes, knight f6 takes and check. Now the only way to hang on to the queen is to move to the corner and now all of a sudden a quiet but deadly move. Rook g6. After this quiet move black is helpless preventing the simple rook capturing on h6 actually either rook would capture and then the black queen is dead. Of course if the queen runs away the same would happen, rook from h4 would capture and the queen would be forced right back. Black would naturally delay the end, black by the way resigned here in the game by giving a check, but indeed that would only delay the end by one move as now the king moved out and nothing changed, black still has no defense against the threat of capturing on h6. And let's see the last example in this lesson. Here we go. In this endgame, Bobby Fischer had the white pieces again against Rosetto, played in Argentina in Mar del Plata in 1959. In this position, we still have material balance. White has a little bit of space advantage and has a bishop versus knight. However, it's not so clear how to continue. I suggest you take a little bit of time and try to figure out what plan you may choose from here on. Another option you may try to simply try to play this position with a friend of yours or if you don't have a friend that's available right now to play with you this position, you can play with one of your computer programs if you have any. Well, in any rate, try to think what to do with white, what should be the game plan from here on. And now let's see what Bobby Fischer did, what he thought was the best approach in trying to gain an advantage. He played rook to d3. Well, what may be the idea behind it? Certainly not doubling the rooks on the d-file but instead it is to swing the rook over to a3 and then after the bishop would move all of a sudden the pawn on a6 can get in trouble. For this very reason black's best option was as suggested by Fisher after the game to play a5 and after a5 if white plays a3 then that square is no longer available for the rook or if white trades then the black knight would get to come to c5 and then capture the pawn on a5. So in this position after white played rook d3 black made an inaccuracy. Black played f5 instead of a5 and now white could follow up the plan by playing rook a3. The threat is rather clear right now, capturing the knight on d7 and then the pawn on a6. Well, what to do with black now? Obviously the rook from d8 cannot move to a8 for example protecting the pawn on a6 because it would leave the knight on d7 unprotected. In the game black chose to play knight b8 protecting the pawn on a6. If instead black would now play a5, then the best choice for white is to immediately capture simply on a5 and if pawn captures back then bishop d7, 
On the other hand, capturing on d7 first would be inaccurate because then after rook captures and pawn captures, black would get the opportunity to play rook a8, pinning the pawn and then winning it back. So let's go back to the game and see how it continued after rook a3 and here as I said, black chose to protect the pawn with knight b8. Okay, so one thing we already accomplished, and that is to put the black knight in a passive position. However, again, we need to look for a way how to make progress. One idea that comes to mind is to try to move the white bishop to b7, moving it to c6 right away, and then trying to move it to b7, attack the pawn a second time. The problem is that black may just play rook f7, prevent that. So while it may be not a bad idea, it doesn't seem to quite work right away. And here, white is changing plans completely. Now that the black knight went to a passive position, it is time to open the position. And this is a very common theme actually in many positions that when you had some kind of advantage and the opponent had to go on the defense, like in this case, to put the knight in a rather passive position in its initial square on b8, all of a sudden you change plans and very often open the position. Open the position means to trade some pawns so there will be more open files or diagonals for your pieces. And that's exactly what Fischer did right here by playing c5. Now, of course, the pawn on b6 is hanging, and also the fact that the white pawn could advance to c6 and become a protected pass pawn should also be certainly worrisome for black. So black decided to do the trade. Trade on c5, took back, and trade again, and white took back again. So what did White accomplish with this advancement of the pawn and exchange of pawns? Well, completely opened up the B and C files and uh, of course in such situation the open files can be most effectively used if the rooks can occupy them. And ideally, eventually, both rooks showing up on the seventh rank and as we've already seen in previous lessons, that can be completely deadly for the king. Here, in addition, white has two more important things going for him. The pass pawn on the d file and the fact that the black knight on b8 is completely out of the game. Black played right now king g7 and very good move, rook b3. Now both rooks are occupying the open files and both rooks are ready to enter the seventh rank. And now black made a mistake by making a very natural move, rook f7, to prevent the white rooks from getting to the seventh. A better try was to play king f6, although white has a clear advantage then too, after giving a check and then advancing the d pawn. But black would be still in the game here. Let's go back and see how the actual game ended. After rook f7, which as I said is a mistake, it is a mistake because it allows white to advance the pawn immediately. As now, since the second rook left the 8th rank, the Black Rook is busy guarding the Knight and therefore cannot capture on d6. Also, by the way, White has now attacked the e5 pawn. However, the important part is that after this pawn move, the White Rook is ready to come to the 7th rank. Black continued with Knight d7, protecting the pawn on e5 and attacking the Rook, and now, as planned, Rook c7. Now white is ready to double up with the both rooks on the 7th rank. Black is trying to exchange rooks, but white doesn't deny that, however, wants to do it under his own terms. 
and played rook bb7, forcing the issue of the trade of the rooks. And black doesn't have much of a choice, but indeed to trade. And now, take back with the pawn. Black is in serious trouble. Rook moved to c8. Now the next task is to chase the rook out from the promotion square c8. Of course, if the bishop would succeed to attack the rook, it would be game over. Also, if the white rook could go to b8, wouldn't be bad, except for the fact that the pawn on c7 is hanging. Also, at the moment, the white bishop cannot go to d7 because the knight is there. So white needs to improve the position a little bit. Move the bishop to b3. And amazingly, black pretty much is in a zugzwang. Kept making some pawn moves, but as we shall see soon, those pawn moves are running out. And right now, black doesn't have any more neutral pawn move. Any pawn move would lose a pawn right away. On the other hand, if any of the other three pieces move, black would have immediate loss. Let's go through those options one by one. If the rook moves, obviously the white pawn just promotes with a discovered check. And that wouldn't be a good idea for black. Or, if the king moves away from the knight, then already white is ready for rook b8. And if pawn is taken, then the knight is falling. That's pretty cute. Or, finally, if the knight moves, then the white bishop finally gets to come to e6. What a perfect Zugzwang example. Quite impressive. And finally, let's see the jewel of the week. Here we go. This position has been composed by Pollard in 1972. As you shall see, it's quite impressive. At the moment, black has an extra knight and pawn. It's true, the knight could be captured right away. However, black could not have any illusions of winning the game after grabbing the knight and then the pawn, as black would get away after bishop takes pawn with a draw. Promoting the pawn to a queen right away doesn't work either, because black will capture the pawn on c6 with a check, with a fork, and then black will actually have winning chances, having a number of extra pawns. So what to do? How can white not only save the game, but actually win it? Try to think and figure out what's the creative and beautiful way to win the game. And here is the answer. The pawn should promote to a knight and not to a queen. That's called under promotion. If now the king moves to d8, then already white wins easy with a check and then grabbing the knight, promoting to a queen. Okay, so let's go back and see what happens if the king rather goes to d6. How can white win now? Well, obviously the only try is to advance the pawn and trying to promote it. But the catch is that the black knight can move away and getting ready that now when the pawn promotes to a queen on c8, then a four comes with knight a7 and draw. At least. Amazingly yet, in this position, white is winning, in fact winning right away, by promoting the pawn to a knight, under promoting the second pawn as well. And beautiful checkmate. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did this amazing endgame, as well as the nice games of Bobby Fisher. Thank you for listening, and so long until next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>